Hey, it's Steve, and welcome back to Steve's Trains. This is a compilation video of the four-part series I had in 2021 on building this three and a half by five and a half foot end scale project layout. This compilation video strips out all the beginnings and endings of each of the individual videos and a few bits here and there to overall shorten the whole viewing time of the entire build series on this layout. Anyway, if you've already watched the whole series, there's not really anything new here to watch. But if you want to watch it again or you haven't seen it yet, this does provide a way to watch the entire layout build in a shorter condensed time relative to watching the entire four part series. Anyway, hope you enjoy the video and thanks for watching. Okay, so this new three and a half by five and a half foot end scale layout project you can see here features a double track twice around design. The size of this layout is the absolute largest I can fit in the back of my vehicle, and so that was the size constraint limitation I had to work with on this design. The double track twice around design is certainly track heavy, but does allow for running longer trains, such as passenger trains, in a small space without having the train chase its tail too much. While there aren't a lot of switching options here, the layout does offer some operation, with effectively an interchange track at the top, a major warehouse to switch in the middle, and a team track at the bottom right serving a construction area. The two crossovers also allow the left side of the layout to be used as a runaround track for switching operations as needed. I'll have a link in the video description where you can check out the full list of Kato track pieces used in the layout construction, but the minimum radius on the inner track is 12.4 inches and the minimum radius on the outer track is 13.7 inches. Those radius curves are only on the inner loop on the left hand side and that part is mostly under the mountain. The other curves all have radii ranging from between 15 and 18.9 inches, so passenger trains will look good on most of those curves, and the tighter ones in the mountain won't really be seen anyway. And so pretty much any available locomotive should run fine. The layout will have a New England fall theme to it, and so it will be fun to create lots of colorful deciduous trees for the layout. Anyway, let's go on to the layout construction. In terms of lumber, I used two pieces of 1x6 pine that were 66 inches long, five uh, 1x6 pine that were 42, two sections of 1x3 pine that were 63 inches long, not the 64.5 you see on the screen, and then four sections of 1x3 that were 42 inches long. And then for legs, I used actually uh, two types of legs, four screw-on legs and four of these kind of big butcher block legs uh, that, that are bolted on and the screw on legs are so I can quickly put the legs on and off during construction of the layout. So I can put the legs on, stand it up, work on the layout, and then unscrew them and stand the layout up against a wall, uh, allowing me to get a car back in the garage. So uh, that's the main reason I have those. And then the beefier legs that are bolted on are obviously for more permanent installation of the layout. I needed four brackets for the screw on legs, a dozen or so, six inch long, quarter inch bolts with washers and nuts, uh, and probably five inch long bolts would have worked, I think, but I had six inch bolts on hand, so I used those, and those were obviously long enough. Um, I also used one four by eight sheet of two inch insulation foam board, one four by eight sheet of one inch insulation foam board, and a four by eight sheet of half inch foam board. For assembly, I used lots of glue, wood screws, nails, and then I also used three cans of Great Stuff Expanding Spray Foam, which really kind of helps bind everything together as well as fill in some of the gaps. And I did use several pounds of sculpt mold I have had comments in the past about wasting money with sculpt mold since it is more expensive than other options, but that's really only if you buy it in those small bags from craft stores, which cost I think like $4 a pound or something like that. But you can actually buy it in bulk, like 25, 50 pound bags, that kind of thing, um, from art dealers online. And then at that rate, it's like about $1.75 a pound. So it's really pretty inexpensive. And for a layout like this, uh, you know, I might use 10 pounds of sculpt mold, I don't know. And so really I'm looking at, you know, 15 to $20 worth of sculpt mold for this whole layout project. So it's not really that expensive when you buy it in bulk. So to assemble the frame, I started with the end pieces. I glued and screwed on a 42 inch long section of the one x three to the 42 inch long section of one x six. And then for the other end, I actually just used two pieces of one x three uh, to make up that 42 inch section because I could better make use of the materials that way. It wouldn't have to waste a couple scrap pieces. I then did the same thing for the long sides of the frame, but uh, those one by threes on the long sides needed to be three inches shorter than the one by six side because I did actually want to have that nest inside of the side pieces. 
Once I had all the sides done, it was time to assemble them, and so I added glue to another 42 inch long piece of 1x6 and put that on one end as well, resting it on top of those inner 1x3s, which kind of made a nice little shelf there. And to keep things square, I used some corner clamps. And then I drilled pilot holes in various places and then put screws through that 1x6 that's horizontal into the side pieces of the uh, layout framing. I also drilled a couple pilot holes on each corner and used a couple finish nails on each corner to further secure things while the glue dried. I put another 1x6 on the far end and then glued and nailed a third uh, 42 inch section of 1x6 in the middle. At this point, I took the mostly completed frame and test fit it in the back of my vehicle to make sure it would actually fit. Uh, since that would be kind of a, a pretty frustrating thing to finish the layout and then not have it fit in the back of the car. And so everything was fine and I was able to keep working on the layout. Next I took four heavy duty top plates and attached those to each corner of the bottom of the layout. Each of these are held on by five screws and a 28 inch long table leg can then be screwed into each plate, making for quick and easy legs. Again, I'll also be bolting on some stout butcher block legs later on, but these are great for quick setup and takedown of the layout during construction, or even afterwards if you want to store it vertically. The interior of the layout was to be filled in with two inch thick insulation foam board. And this foam can be found in pink, blue, and yellow colors depending on where you buy it and what manufacturer it comes from. I had already cut the four by eight foot sheet to fit roughly, and then I placed it on top of the layout in order to cut it to exact size. Once I had the two inch foam cut, I put the half inch foam on top and cut that one to size as well. Now one thing to watch out for is that the half inch foam does come with a layer of plastic on both the top and bottom faces. So be sure you pull that out before attempting to actually glue it or anything because otherwise it's just not gonna stick to that plastic. Uh, the one inch and two inch foam boards do not have plastic, at least the ones uh, that I've bought. It's possible that other manufacturers uh, have plastic on there. So just be careful and watch for that. I took out both layers of foam and then added glue on the 1x6 cross pieces and then I decided I might as well add a couple more 1x3 cross pieces for additional strength and support. Uh, and so I glued those in place and then inserted a 2 inch piece of foam board. At this time I cut a hole in the center of one of the side panels for the Digitrax local net panel since this is going to be a DCC operated layout. And this would have been easier to do with my jigsaw but our vehicle was blocking the cabinet that I keep the saw in and I couldn't get it, I couldn't get to it without moving the car out of the way. And because it was really cold outside, I didn't want to open the garage door and have the garage get 30 degrees colder real quick. So I just drilled some holes in the side and then used my coping saw to cut the rectangular opening. Pine cuts easily, so that wasn't very hard and was very quick, but I did mark up the side of the layout a bit, but I'll sand that out later. And for now you can just see how this panel fits. I put the half inch piece of foam board back on the layout and then assembled all the track I had on hand at the time. I still hadn't had some of the pieces arrive yet uh, at the time I was doing this, but I had enough to actually get pretty much everything marked out. And so once everything was assembled that I had, I just took a Sharpie to mark out where I wanted to cut the foam board. Then I took my knife and cut the half inch foam board in kind of a cookie cutter style. I started working on cutting supports for the half inch foam out of pieces of scrap foam that I had, and I got everything roughly lined up to the heights that I wanted, and then I worked on cutting the supports more precisely. To make risers, I cut off a block of one inch thick foam and then using a ruler cut progressively larger slices off using the previous piece as a guide. I ended up with a whole series of riser blocks to put under the half inch foam base for the track. That way I could have a nice smooth gray to the track as it rose two inches from the front to the back of the layout.
I arranged the blocks evenly and then added some waist to keep everything weighted down so it wouldn't shift. And then I added some additional riser pieces to fill in any of the gaps that were more than about four inches or so long. With all the blocks ready to go, I removed each block one at a time and then added some glue and then replaced it and then worked my way through all the support blocks on that one side. I used a few long screws as well to help clamp all the foam pieces together. This way I wouldn't have to worry about anything getting knocked out of place while I was working on the remainder of the layout. The back side of the layout was all one elevation without grades and the main center area was also going to be one elevation without grades as well. And so those areas were obviously very easy to set up. I glued and screwed those sections together and then I replaced the half inch foam with the one inch piece foam uh, instead of layering two half inch pieces for the middle, just to make it a little bit easier to construct that part of the layout. Once I had all my foam risers in place, I used some great stuff expanding foam to fill in all the gaps. I wanted to make sure the half inch top layer of foam was really supported securely everywhere and adding the expanding foam adds a tremendous amount of strength by kind of binding everything together and filling in those little gaps. And it's also a great adhesive and so it does uh, work really well for this application, but it does obviously stick really well to everything, including your hands. So be careful when you're using it and do wear gloves uh, since it does, again, become very hard to get off your hands if you do get it on your skin. While the foam expanded and dried, I patched all the dimples created by the screws with drywall patching plaster so I'd have a nice smooth surface everywhere on the layout. The expanding foam did need to be trimmed up, of course, in many areas, and then I needed to carve out the lake and river area. I tried hacking away at it with my hot wire cutter with moderate success, and so eventually I just kind of gave up and went back to using my knife. I could have used my Stanley Sureform tool, which would have worked great here. It would have been a great application for that tool, but it was extremely dry with the Arctic air in place, and the static was already terrible, and I don't think I could have ever gotten all those little bits of foam off of me if I had used a foam shaving tool, so I decided to just cut off bigger chunks with a knife and then fill it in, smooth it out with sculpt mold later instead of getting a nice smooth uh, curved surface there uh, just because the air was just really, really dry. The Pink Panther made a brief appearance here at this point as this was to be the top of the tunnel sections. To make the tunnel walls, I took some half inch thick foam board and then scored it multiple times to allow it to bend easier. I then cut the board to the needed height and tacked that in place with some nails. I did the same thing for a divider between the two tunnel sections though that isn't really needed, but this way, if you look into a tunnel, you can see just that one track and you won't see across to the other track. And so it does make it look more like a tunnel and not just a large opening inside the tunnel portal. So you can see how things looked at that point. I also bolted on the large block legs. I simply drilled a hole from each side of the corner through the side of the layout and the leg, and then put a bolt through each of those and tightened it up really good, and it was a pretty secure leg setup. I might have to go back and add some additional supports, but it was really quite secure, just with a couple bolts on each side. Next, I cut some rough tunnel portals out of foam and attached those to each ends of the tunnels. I'll eventually add some real tunnel portals here, probably made out of plaster, uh, but this will help to provide something to attach those future tunnel portals to, and will also allow me to complete the inside of the tunnels. Here's a quick overview of the partially completed tunnel area. I did fill in some of the gaps with some more spray foam, and then I added some additional blocks of foam and spray foam on the top section of the tunnel uh, that you'll see in a bit. At this point, I mixed up a large batch of sculpt mold to, to which I added some brown paint. You don't have to do that. That's certainly just something I do uh, to kind of provide some tint to the plaster in there. So if you do chip off a chunk of sculpt mold at some point, damaging the layout in some random way, you're not gonna have a glaring patch of white there from the plaster. You'll just see, you know, sort of a light brown color, which will look a little bit better. I worked the sculpt mold around much of the base of the layout including to the inside of the tunnels. This will provide a nice rock texture to the tunnel walls and make them look more realistic if you peek inside the tunnels. I continue to add more sculpt mold all around the layout, and I'll need to add more eventually later on here and there, but I wanted to get most of it done at this point, uh, just because it is obviously kind of messy to do. And if you do that before you do a lot of the track installation, you just have that much less risk of getting your track covered in sculpt mold. You don't have to worry about covering it up as much. And so it's just something I like to get out of the way as much as possible before I do my track laying.
Okay, so before installing the track and the wiring, I went around the layout and sanded the foam smooth so there were no small bumps that would prevent the track from laying flat. Once that was done and cleaned up, I put the track back on the layout and marked out where I wanted the power leads to go. This layout is being wired for DCC operation and I'm using a Digitrack Zephyr DCC system to power and control things. This base station is great for smaller layouts and has a built-in throttle, plus allows other throttles to be connected. I have also connected a Digitrax panel that I installed into the front of the layout fascia to the base station and that allows you to plug in some additional handheld throttles. Since the base station is small and lightweight, I have it mounted to the layout with Velcro. I have two strips of Velcro attached to the front of the wood panel that I attached to the layout frame using a piano hinge and a couple of wood blocks on the back side of that panel kind of keep it sticking out at a nice angle and prevent it from hanging flat. The base station and a handheld throttle or two can then be attached to the Velcro strips but still be removed easily if needed. So when moving the layout, I can take off the Digitrax base station, fold up the panel that holds them, and then the layout will fit into the back of my vehicle for transport. You can see here the locations I decided to add power leads using Kato terminal rail joiners. Uh, those are marked in red, as well as where I put in insulated rail joiners, and those are marked in black. The Kato number six turnouts are power routing, and so to help prevent shorts, I put insulated joiners on the frog end of the turnouts and made sure I had power coming in by the point side of each turnout. Even so, if you run a train into the turnout from the frog side and the turnout is not aligned to the track the train is on, a short will occur once the train crosses the insulated joiners. The crossovers though are insulated already, and so while they are DCC friendly, you do need to apply power to each leg of the crossover as power will not flow from one side to the other. You don't have to have the power leads directly attached to the ends of the crossover, of course, but making sure you have power connected to tracks on each side somewhere is important. I tried to make sure there was power connected to each track in between each set of turnouts, as well as in a couple of extra locations for redundancy. Using a long drill bit, this is actually a 5 acents drill bit, I drilled a hole through the thick layers of foam at all the locations where power leads needed to go, as well as where the wires for the turnout motors were going to be located. I then ran the wires down through each hole, and since the holes were fairly large, this wasn't really hard, but if you do have smaller holes, you can always put in a drinking straw into the hole to make it easier to push the wires through, since they do have a tendency to kind of snag on the foam. Once the wires are through, you can then just pull that straw out. The most important thing when connecting the terminal rail joiners or soldering on the wire leads, if you do that, is to keep things consistent. In this case, the terminal joiners have a blue and a white wire. I made sure the blue wire was always on the outside rail, the one closest to the layout edge, and the white wire on the inner rail. This way I could connect all the blue wires together and all the white wires together without creating a short circuit. The Kato single crossover was set up to be power routing. I wasn't sure if this would cause a problem or not, so I moved the screws to the non-power routing locations on the back of the crossover. Once the wires were all in place, I used a pair of wire strippers to cut off some of the excess wire and to strip all the ends of the wires. I then ran a pair of heavier gauge wires down from the Digitrax base station to the underside of the layout to serve as the bus wires. I connected all the blue power lead wires from the track to the blue bus wire and all the white wires to the green wire. I would have used a white wire here, but I just did not have a heavier gauge white wire. Then I had a locomotive running on the layout while I connected each group of wires under the layout to the blue and green bus wires. This way, if I heard the locomotive stop, I knew that I had created a short. Uh, obviously, it probably would have sparked as well on the wires, and I would have seen that, but this way, just by hearing that locomotive running, I knew that things were still wired correctly. Once everything was connected and there weren't any issues, I went back and soldered all the wire connections and then covered them with a couple coatings of liquid electrical tape. When connecting the wires, I try to make sure they are always secure without the solder. I do that by wrapping the two wires around each other, then folding back the wire onto itself so they are securely attached. You want to have a strong physical connection first and not rely on the solder to hold the wires together. When soldering the wires, I like to keep the heat on one side and let the solder flow through from the other. I use a HACO soldering station that has an adjustable temperature, but generally one that is hotter or higher wattage is going to heat your connection faster. 
once things have cooled a bit, I come back with the liquid electrical tape. Often I'll use heat shrink tubing as well, since that is probably more robust overall, but in places where there isn't much risk for wires shorting out or where the tubing is hard to use, I just use the liquid electrical tape. It can be messy, however, so you might want to wear gloves when using it. At this point, I decided to get some bridge piers put in place since that would be hard to do once the track was glued down. I made the piers out of pieces of poplar, cut it, just cutting the wood to size and sanding it smooth, and then I glued the piers in place with wood glue, and then mixed up some sculpted mold and used that to help blend them into the scenery. While testing the layout with different locomotives and rolling stock, I learned that I needed to shift the two bridges on the front of the layout off to the right an inch or so in order to prevent longer pieces of rolling stock from hitting the ends of the bridge when coming in from the curved track side. So I added a couple of 1.14 inch pieces of track to the left of the bridge and then adjusted the track pieces to the right so things would still line up correctly. Next, I moved on to drilling holes in the front of the layout for the push button controls I'm using for the turnout controls. I marked the location I wanted each button and clamped a board to the layout to kind of use as a guide. Then I used a 3 quarter inch drill bit to drill each hole since the push buttons have a diameter of just slightly under 3 quarters of an inch. I put some wood putty around the inside of each hole as well as around the front edge so once I sanded that smooth it had a nice opening that was just the right size for each of those push buttons. I soldered wires to the back of each button and then temporarily installed each button in the layout frame. I then hooked up two wires to each of the DS64 units I'm using to control the turnouts uh, that will eventually connect to the DCC bus line that powers the track. I attach these with some double-sided tape to the bottom of the layout for now, and later we'll permanently install them with some screws once I am ready to actually wire all the turnouts. At this point, I moved on to soldering most of the rail joints on the layout. This isn't actually needed, and if your layout will see large temperature swings, soldering every joint will actually cause a problem as the metal rails will expand with hotter temperatures, uh, and that can cause some kinks or buckles in the rail if there's no room for that rail to expand. I have left some of the rail joints on solder though, and will cut some expansion gaps in the rails if needed as conditions warm. Since this layout is being built in the garage and it does get into the hundreds here in the summer, I will see as it does get hotter over the next couple of months if the rails do expand and cause any kinks or buckles anywhere, and then I can go through and cut some additional expansion gaps to make sure all the rails are gonna be in a good shape when it is in some very hot conditions. At the same time, having a lot of the joint solder does help with the overall electrical conductivity around the layout, limiting the number of dead spots that might spring up over time. Alternatively, you could just use more terminal rail joiners or solder more power leads to the track so you don't have as many rail joints in between each of the power leads. When soldering rail joints, like with wires, I try to apply the heat to one side and the solder to the other to help ensure I'm getting a good solid solder joint. Since the Unitrack roadbed is actually plastic, it may soften while you are doing the soldering. So be sure the rail joints are still aligned after the solder cools. If they are not, you can just come back and apply some additional heat, push the rails back into alignments, and then you should be good to go. Once the soldering is done, go back over each joint and file off any solder from the top or inside of the rail. And this is also a good time to file the joints smooth in general to make sure there are no bumps that might derail a freight car. At this point, I figured I should go and do some painting before gluing down the track. I first painted the bridge piers, just a gray color, and then I applied a brown wash of paint under the bridges. Then I painted the same brown wash on the remainder of the layout, kind of moving the track out of the way as I went around. To actually glue down the track to the layout, I simply used my Surebonder hot glue gun and hot glue sticks. The Kato track can be a little tricky to hot glue down since most of the roadbed is hollow, but there are some spots where glue can grab onto. You could simply spread some white glue under the track or even some latex caulk uh, as well and then that would certainly work just fine, but the hot glue does help to hold things in place quickly. The track isn't firmly attached everywhere, but I'll be gluing ballast down along the sides of the track and that will permanently anchor the track in place once I do that. I used some metal machinist blocks to weight down the track as I was gluing along so I wouldn't shift the track out of alignment in the areas that I just applied the glue before the glue dried and this way I could work a little bit faster and not have to wait for the glue to keep drying as I moved along. 
Once the track was glued down, I could flip the layout onto its side in order to complete all the wiring uh, in a much easier manner instead of having to do it upside down underneath the layout. I tried to run most of the track wires through some plastic cable raceway to keep them neat and tidy, and doing so not only makes the underside of the layout look nicer, but it also makes it safer to transport the layout since there is less risk that you might you know, kind of snag some of those wires and rip them out. I then moved on to wiring up the turnouts. Again, the turnouts were wired using two Digitrax DS64 units. You don't need to use these, but it does make control of them a lot easier. You could just use the Kato switch levers or your own momentary toggle switches or push buttons, but the DS64 units allow you to control the turnouts by both push buttons, just in fact a single push button, as well as from your DCC throttle. The DS64 units can control four turnouts each, and so I needed two of those units to control the six turnouts that I have on the layout, including the crossovers. Wiring is fairly straightforward, but you do have to make sure you don't connect a wire to the wrong terminal. First, I connected all of the wires from the push button turnout controls to a long terminal strip, and then I added another terminal strip to connect wires from the DCC bus to, and then from there to the DS64 units. This way, if I needed to remove one of, the two, one of those two units, I wouldn't have to actually worry about any solder joints, and all I had to do was remove the wires from those terminal strips. Then it was a matter of connecting the two wires from each turnout motor to one of the four pairs of connection points on each DS64 unit. The connections on the DS64 are labeled for turnouts one, two, three, and four, and so getting those connections made was easy with the built-in screw terminals. To control the turnouts by momentary push button, you connect one wire from each push button to one of the switch control terminals with the S1 terminal controlling the turnout connected to the first set of terminals, the S2 controlling the turnout to the second set of terminals, and so on. The other wires from each push button are connected all together and then connected to one common terminal on the DS64 unit. So it was just really a matter of making sure I connected the wires from the DS64 to the correct push button switch wires on the terminal strip. Once all the wires were connected, I again used some pieces of cable raceway to contain all the wires and make everything look a lot neater on the bottom of the layout. The way these units work with push buttons is that every push of the button will flip the direction of the turnout, allowing one button to control both directions of a turnout. So I only needed six push buttons to control the six turnouts. And these push buttons I found are really nice and they sit nearly flush to the layout fascia. The buttons themselves do not stick out beyond the housing and so there's no real risk of snagging those or accidentally pushing them and they're not going to get damaged very easily during transport. I had originally planned on recessing the buttons so they wouldn't be damaged in transit, but again because they're so flat, they can basically just sit flush on a layout fascia. While I don't have any lighting installed on the layout at this time, I went ahead and set up a 12 volt power supply, controls, and a couple terminal strips to make it easy to connect lighting later in the layout build process. I have a regular light switch with three toggle switches on it that you would you know, just use in your house, typically on the wall, um, built into the layout fascia. And each of these buttons in turn can be set up to control one set of lights or other accessories. The wires from the power supply and the switches are all connected to a terminal strip, and then I can connect wires from the terminal strip to groups of layout lighting and so on later on. So I might have one switch control structure lighting, one control street lights, and another control you know, lighted signs or other accessories. And so you can see the completed layout wiring here, well except for the future wiring that will be done for the street lighting and, and that kind of thing. I have my DS64 units in the middle here, the terminal strip above that that joins the wires from the push buttons to those that connect to the DS64 units, uh, the Digitrax panel up on top here for connecting the handheld throttles uh, that is in turn connected to the Zephyr base station by a single cable. All the wires to the control switches for the layout lighting run through the fascia here on the top right, and then to this terminal strip to which I can connect the future lighting. All the wires to the Digitrack Zephyr base station itself run up through the layout here on the top left. Then I have the power from the base station as well as a 12 volt DC power supply connected to an extension cord mounted to the underside of the layout here on the left. And so only a single power cord is needed to power everything on the layout. So another change I made at this point was to actually install new legs on the corners of the layout. I originally used some wood legs that screwed onto the layout base as well as a set of bolt-on legs uh, that were a lot sturdier. 
While those bigger legs looked nice, they were actually pretty hard to put on and take off uh, because they had a lot of bolts to, to use. And the smaller legs that screwed on you know, were very easy to put on and take off, but they weren't really very sturdy and not really good for you know, permanent use. So I looked around and found this set of metal legs at the tablelegs.com website. This kit includes heavy duty plates that you can screw onto the bottom of your table or layout project and each are attached with eight screws so you get a pretty sturdy connection there. And then the kit also includes plates that allow you to actually fold the legs up so you don't actually have to remove them during transport. Now I initially tried those and that's what I had actually planned to use but it puts a lot of stress on the bottom of the layout when locking those in place and opening them back up. And so because it is just pine, I was concerned that I would eventually you know, rip out or, or even just loosen those plates over time just from the opening and closing action of those legs. These legs are a couple inches in diameter and do have adjustable feet. And this allows you to level the layout as well, which is really nice. So if you have a floor that's not quite even, you can keep things uh, nice and level. And, and that will also help prevent you from scratching any floor surface that might you know, possibly get damaged from the feet. The legs thread on very easily. The metal plates have a bolt welded on and then the legs just thread on and thread off very easily. So it's very easy to transport the layout by taking the legs off and putting it in the back of your vehicle. And at this point, I decided to actually finish the layout frame. I sanded everything down with a series of coarse, medium, and then fine grit sandpapers on my orbital sander to get a nice smooth surface to the wood and then and also to sand off any of the glue or paint and so forth that was on the layout frame from doing the initial scenery work. And once that was done and all the dust wiped off, I taped off the controls and then put two applications of a cherry stain on the layout frame, wiping off the excess each time. And then after a day or so of drying time, I applied three coats of satin polyurethane. The poly coats give the wood a lot of protection, making it more resistant to damage, and also give the wood a much richer look. I do plan to cover the wood while I'm working on the scenery work going forward, but this way if I do get any paint or glue on the frame at this point in time, it's not going to soak into the wood and I should be able to clean it off fairly easily. I may have to go back at the end of construction and kind of lightly sand everything down one more time and then put a final coat of polyurethane on uh, to make everything look really good once everything is complete. So once the final coat of polyurethane had dried, I installed the controls back on the layout. I simply glued in the push buttons with some hot glue and then the other switches for the layout lighting and for the control panel for the throttle units were attached with screws. To hold the Zephyr base station, I used two strips of Velcro on the back of the Zephyr unit and then ran two horizontal strips of Velcro on the wood panel it was mounted on. And so to make sure the adhesive Velcro wouldn't actually pull off over time, I attached each strip with three additional screws as well. And that would securely anchor the Velcro to the wood so it wouldn't you know, pull off at some point down the road. And so this way, I'm able to just stick on the base station very easily. It's very secure that way. It's not going to come off. And I can easily attach or you know, remove the throttle units uh, that might be plugged in as well to that strip of Velcro. And I might add some additional Velcro patches here and there on the layout frame, just so there's a few extra spots to kind of hang your throttle units. So once all the wiring was done, I moved on to weathering all of the unit track. While the Kato track is super reliable and extremely easy to use, the Code 80 rail is way oversized for end scale. So weathering the rail doesn't just help the color look more realistic, but by also darkening the rail, it helps to hide the overall height of the rail to some extent as well. I use the Woodland Scenics Tidy Track track painter pens for this project, and I use the steel rail color for the rail itself. First off, when opening the package up, note that you do get an extra brush chip for the paint pen, and you do not want to lose that since you will need it. In fact, you're actually going to need about 10 more of those, but they only give you the one. So do make sure you do keep that extra tip. To start using the pens, you need to shake the pen well for a minute or so, and then depress the tip several times on a hard surface to get the paint flowing through the brush chip. Then you can run the brush chip along the side of the rail. I found that one pass wouldn't put enough paint on the rail and so I had to often make two or three passes to get the rail fully coated. These brush tips are also less durable than other similar paint pens I've used before. And so after doing just one section of track, the brush tip was already kind of torn up a bit from the spike heads on the track. And you can carefully trim the tips a little bit uh, once or so before you try to replace it. Or you could try flipping the brush tip around, pulling it out, putting it back in the other way and then trimming the tip on the other side and maybe get a few uses out of that one, but you are going to need to swap it out with a new tip once it becomes too worn. 
which does happen unfortunately very, very quickly. For the turnouts and crossovers, I used Neolube on the points and frogs and other areas that I wanted to darken but didn't want to lose electrical conductivity. Neolube is essentially a powdered graphite type mix in alcohol that can be painted onto the surface. It adheres well and can be used on your locomotive wheels and other metal surfaces that you want to darken. The Neolube really helps to make turnouts and crossovers look more realistic by toning down the bright shiny rails, hinges, and other parts of the turnout, and you're not going to lose electrical conductivity anywhere that you put it. I still use the paint pens on the outside of the rails and in areas where electrical conductivity wasn't an issue, and then cleaned off the tops of the rail before the paint fully dried. You can see here the difference between the painted and unpainted rail. The top section of track has had the rail painted, while the bottom section is still unpainted. The top section does have wood ties and the bottom section does have concrete ties, so the track itself does look different too. But note how the bright shiny rail has been transformed into something that looks at least more realistic and it does not look quite as large either uh, from a distance. Since the brush tips of the pens gave out really quick, uh, bef well before the paint and the pen did, I switched to just painting the rail with a brush. I pulled the brush tip out of the pen and then shook the paint out into a cup. And you might have to poke a nail or a small screwdriver up into the paint pen to help the paint fill out a lot easier. But just painting the rail with a brush ended up being a lot easier in the end than using the paint markers since the brush tips gave out so quickly. I also used the weathered tie paint pen to paint some of the track ties, and that worked really well. The pens worked well in this application, and I went around the layout painting various ties with the pens, so there was some variation in track tie color. When it dries, the color difference is subtle, but it does add one more level of realism after the track has been ballasted. If you plan to use the Kata Unitrack as it is without adding ballast, then I would just skip that step since you are going to get paints on all the plastic ballast between the ties. Next, I mixed up a ballast blend to use on this layout. I picked up several bags of the Kato ballast, which does closely match the track bed color, and you can use that right out of the bag and just run it along the edges of the roadbed to help soften those sharp lines along the roadbed edge and have a much better looking layout without fully ballasting the track. However, I like to fully ballast the track on layouts, and I didn't like the color as is out of the bag. So I dumped all the bags of ballast into a larger bag, added various weathering powders to the mix, along with another brand of ballast that I had laying around, and I mixed all that up and had a blend that was a little bit more pleasing to my eye than the brighter looking ballast right out of the bag from Kato. So I could finish off the mountain area, the first areas of track that I ballasted were the two tunnels. You don't really need to ballast everything inside of a tunnel like this, but if I run a camera on a train through the tunnel, I want it to look good. I like to start out by painting full strength PVA type glue along the edge of the roadbed, as well as along either side of it. I also painted a strip of glue in between each of the two tracks. Putting a layer of glue down first helps to ensure that the ballast will adhere well to the track and layout base and will be less likely to crumble off at some point in the future. After I had the glue in place, I used a small paper cup to pour ballast on either side of each track section, and then a brush to smooth out the ballast to my liking. I sprayed sections of ballast down with alcohol, and then dribbled on diluted matte medium with a pipette. It is important to soak the ballast thoroughly with the glue mix, so you don't end up with layers of ballast in between the bottom and top layers that are still loose, which could result in parts of your ballast working loose or breaking off it with time. I also ballasted a section of track outside of a tunnel on the lower loop at this point using the same techniques. After making sure I could reach both tunnels from the access hole on the side of the layout, I test fit the top of the mountain over the tunnel areas and trimmed off a few areas of excess foam. Then I applied excessive amounts of glue everywhere and attached the top of the mountain, using some nails to help hold everything in place while the glue dried. I glued in scrap pieces of foam to help fill in some of the gaps, and then mixed up a big batch of Sculpta Mold so I could cover all of the remaining foam areas on top of the mountain. It turned out that I mixed up way too much at one time and couldn't apply all of it before it began to harden on me. So I ended up having to toss half the mixture out and mix up a second batch to finish the job. And the Sculpta Mold was fully dry after a few days later, and it does take longer to fully dry than regular plaster, especially when the humidity is high. I painted everything with a brown wash made from about 20% brown paint and 80% water. The thin paint can easily soak into the various grooves and cracks in the Sculpta Mold and tends to pool in those areas as well, creating variation in the shade of the color. 
I also tested a Woodland Scenics plaster tunnel portal in one spot, but quickly realized that it was not going to provide the needed clearance on each side nor on top without a fair bit of modification. So I held off installing any tunnel portals for quite a while to kind of think about the best solution for, uh, for those areas. Next, I painted on a darker paint wash on the landscape to help provide some additional variation and contrast to the ground and rock areas. And since the main industry is more than an inch lower than the central town area, I decided to build a retaining wall to allow me to expand the central town area a bit more. I made the retaining wall using some large strips of sheet styrene that were cut to height of the wall that I needed, and then I glued those together using some splice plates on the back side of the wall. I then cut several narrow strips that I glued onto the wall for more detail. I glued one strip along the top of the wall, then vertical strips every couple of inches. I test fit the wall on the layout and then after painting the wall a concrete color I pinned it in place with some nails and then applied a thick bead of glue along the back edge of the wall. Since some of the glue was oozing out underneath the wall I poured some dirt on the front side to kind of help absorb that glue and to cover uh, just the signs of the glue seepage. At this point I shifted gears to installing some track signals. I picked up some signals from Z stuff for trains and decided to install them in the location you see here. I should note at this point that some people have had issues getting orders filled from Z stuff lately, so I have a link below in the description, but you might want to kind of try and contact them first before placing any orders to see if uh, you can get an update or just get some information on their current status. I don't receive any commission or anything from them, but I do like their signals and it has been a nice addition to this layout. Since the signals were an afterthought, there were only a handful of locations I could put them because the existing scenery and wiring underneath the layout was there already in place and I didn't want to have to disrupt or move anything that was uh, already you know, glued or screwed onto the bottom of the layout. So the locations I picked were basically just those where they wouldn't interfere with existing work on the bottom of the layout. I have a separate video on these signals, so I won't go into the full detail here, but these signals have built-in IR sensors and, and transmitters, and the whole electronic circuit board is mounted on the bottom of the signal. So you do need to drill a pretty large 3 quarter inch diameter hole to accommodate that circuit board built into the base of the signal units. I did just that on each side of the track, and after soldering on some longer wires to the included ones, I installed the signals on the layout. The signals do have a sensitivity adjustment screw, so you do need to make sure you have the adjustment set properly before securing that signal to the layout. If the signal is too sensitive, trains on the opposite track will trip the signal, and if it's not sensitive enough, obviously a train on the track the signal is placed next to won't actually trip the signal either. So how close or far from the track the signal is placed will of course play a role in how you have to have that sensitivity adjustment screw changed. If you just want the signals to operate independently, all you need to do is hook up the two power wires to a power source and you're good to go. But you can also daisy chain them together so multiple signals will work together or install additional sensors for the crossing signals uh, and so forth to trip them from a different location. If you just connect the power, the track signals will turn red when a train passes, and then after eight seconds, it will turn to yellow and then to green after another eight seconds. If connected to additional signals, the color changes will be controlled based on the signals down the line. So a signal won't turn from yellow to green, for example, until the next signal turns from red to yellow. While waiting for my second order of signals to arrive, I went back to working on the layout scenery. I decided I didn't really like the original waterfall river area, and so I raised up part of it with a layer of one inch foam. I glued and nailed the foam down and then spread some sculptal mold around the foam edges to blend those into the surrounding scenery. And I also built a base area for hotel out of styrene that will overlook the eventual lake and waterfall. I spread sculptal mold around that area as well. For the front of the lake area, I built up a dam made out of the sculptal mold that extends about a centimeter or so above the front edge of the lake. This way I'll be able to pour a lake of resin and it won't simply flow you know, off the edge and downstream. There will then be a waterfall at that front of the lake area that flows down into the river under the two bridges at the front of the layout. Next, I worked on the front right section of the layout. There's going to be a small industry there and I wanted to have the track embedded in concrete in this area. So I built most of the base area out of styrene but decided to fill the space in between the rails with plaster instead of styrene, uh, mainly because there was a curve in the track there. I simply used some regular drywall spackle to fill the area between the rails and this type is pink out of the pail but it does turn white when dry. I spread it out smoothly and then cut grooves along the sides of each rail. 
and once everything was dry, I spray painted everything with a concrete color. I worked on a bit more scenery in the left front area of the layout, putting down some static grass and ground foam, and then it was time to finally install the tunnel portals. I found a tunnel portal design online that I thought would work well, and then I edited the design to be a bit uh, larger in width and height to meet the clearance needs that I had on this layout. I printed out four of the tunnel portals with my 3D printer, and then cut away scenery as needed to get the tunnel portals to fit in each location. After painting the tunnel portals with spray paint and applying a black wash and some weathering powders, I glued them in place with wood glue and a few spots of hot glue. On the back of the layout, the two tunnel openings are too close together for the tunnel portals to work as they were, so I had to cut one side of each tunnel portal off and then glue those together, and then I put a brick column in between to hide the seam. The completed unit was then glued in place the same way using wood glue and hot glue uh, as I did for the front two tunnel portals. I mixed up a small batch of sculpt mold to blend in the tunnel portals to the surrounding scenery and making sure I kept the cup containing it right in front of the camera so you couldn't see how I did it. But here you can see how they looked after being blended into the surrounding rock work but before I actually painted that area of sculpt mold. It was then time to finish up more of the passenger station at the front of the layout. I wanted to have a platform on the other side of the tracks from the station, along with a walkway that crossed the tracks. So I cut some pieces of styrene to fashion a walkway across the tracks, and then I built up a platform on the other side by simply stacking up pieces of styrene until I had the height that I wanted. I glued that in place, and while the glue was drying, I patched a few gaps between the track and surrounding scenery with more of the patching plaster. And then once that was in place, I could ballast the track on that part of the layout using the same techniques I showed before. I continued around the layout and ballasted more of the back side of the layout and then started working on installing some of the structures. I drilled a hole for the LED wires in the warehouse structure, fed those wires through, and then glued the warehouse in place. I drilled a hole for the hotel lighting and then started working on preparing the roadways through the central town area. Since I used Woodland Scenic Smooth It for most of the road areas, I masked off all the areas I didn't want to get covered in plaster, and then I mixed up a batch of Smooth It plaster using some Black India ink for some color so it wouldn't dry a pure white. I poured out the plaster and worked it around using scrap pieces of styrene and spreaders, and then when the plaster was starting to set a bit, I pulled up the masking tape and then continued to work the plaster smooth the best I could. As it began to set, I kind of switched to smoothing things with my finger, and then once it was fully dry, I used a sanding sponge to get me an even smoother initial road surface. Even so, there were still plenty of imperfections, and so I mixed up another small batch of Smooth It and spread that around the road areas. And then with this batch, I pretty much just scraped the plaster onto the existing road base, trying to fill in all the little gaps and dips and get things as smooth as possible. After another sanding and some cleanup in places with a knife, uh, things were pretty much ready to go. I placed the gas station on the layout, which was built from a Walther's kit, and traced around the base sections with a knife, and then came back and scraped away the plaster from those areas uh, that the gas station base would be sitting in. And then after a good vacuum, I was able to glue down a couple of the base pieces for the gas station. Uh, before I went any further, I realized that was probably a good place to stop and start painting the road areas, and so I masked off everything that wasn't road and sprayed a few colors of gray spray paint on the roadway areas. The various colors create some variation in texture and shading to the road areas that makes it look a little bit more realistic than one uniform color. I'll eventually come back and hit the road areas with some weathering powders and washes, but I was ready to move on with more structure installation at that point. So I drilled two holes for the gas station lights, one where the pumps were located and one where the gas station convenience store was located. I had to drill these kind of at an angle so I wouldn't drill down into the Digitrax DCC switch machine controls that were installed directly under that location. I then glued down the gas station pump section and glued down the passenger station. I wanted to have the interiors on some of the structures visible, and so I picked up a Rumetz kit to add those uh, interior details. I do have a video on using those Rumetz kits, and so check that out if you want to learn more about them. So I won't go into full detail here, but these are simple cardstock kits that you fold up into rooms that can be glued inside your structures. They include LED lights that are compatible with the Just Plug system, and an opening in the ceiling of each room uh, where you can put those lights. While just cardstock printouts, the kits really do make the structure interiors look a lot nicer and are especially interesting to see at night when lighted. With those interiors installed, I was able to glue down the gas station and then drill holes for the other structures in the town area. 
Three of the structures were pre-built woodland scenic structures that had lights already installed, and the other one was built from one of the kits included in the woodland scenics town and industry kit that they put together to work with their 3 by 6 foot end scale layout kit they offer. After drilling holes for the structure lights through a styrene sidewalk base, I realized I probably should have installed the street lights into that sidewalk base before gluing it down to the layout. So I ripped up the styrene sidewalk and drilled small holes for the woodland scenic street lights I used. And then since the wires were small, I simply taped them to a pencil and dropped them through the holes so I could easily pull the wires through. Then I glued the sidewalk and building base back down to the layout. And while that was drying, I drilled a hole for the IR sensor I was going to install for the crossing lights. I also added a couple more lights to the station area and then glued down the remaining structures using super glue. I weighted down each of the structures while the glue dried to make sure they were being bonded to the base well. Wiring up all the lights was a pain and it took quite a long time, but the effort was worth it. Since the street lights and other small LED lights use very thin wire, if you do decide to cut the wire to length, you need to strip off the coating in some way. And while you can try to strip it off with a knife or wire strippers, you probably won't have a lot of success uh, because the wire is just extremely thin and easy to break. So the easy way is to take a lighter and simply burn off the coating on the ends of each of those wires. That works great, and it's far easier than trying to manually strip the coating off. You can see here what some of those lit building interiors look like using the Roomettes kits. It is hard to tell in scale that everything is just two-dimensional, and at any rate, it looks a lot better than just simply seeing a blank interior. The hotel and warehouse don't have any detailed interiors, and if I had more time to spend on this project, it would have been nice to try to produce detailed interiors for those, but being larger structures, it would just take a lot more time and effort. I mentioned that the Z-Stuff signals can be somewhat problematic to get a hold of, and the second order of signals took almost two months to arrive after I ordered them. But they finally did arrive, and you can see them all here with extension wires soldered on. I had to find different locations for these on the layout that didn't interfere with the existing wiring under the layout, so the locations weren't ideal, but worked well enough for this layout. The layout isn't signaled prototypically, but the signals still add a lot of interest to the layout. I drilled the needed holes, glued the signals in place, and then scenic around them. I initially wired the signals all together so they would be all daisy chain and kind of work prototypically in terms of their progression of lights, but it didn't really work out quite that well because of the small layout size. Since I only had three sets of signals, you could only get the proper changing from red to yellow to green if the train length was just right and the train speed was just right. Uh, connecting them all together would work better in a larger layout uh, with more sets of signals and just overall more space between them. So I went back to just having each signal on a time delay. The effect is similar and it works regardless of train length or speed, though you can still run a long train around the layout fast enough to prevent a signal from ever turning to green uh, since the layout just isn't that big. Just using the time delay makes the wiring a lot easier though, since all you have to do is connect each of them to power. I installed a couple of sets of terminal strips under the layout to connect all the signals to, and then I have those terminal strips in turn connected to one of the toggle switches on the front of the layout so they can be turned on or off. I also have a sound unit connected to the crossing signals glued to the underside of the layout and that sound unit is connected to its own toggle switch so you can keep the sound off but keep the signals on and, and the reality is while the crossing bell signal sound is nice to have in practice you probably aren't going to want to hear it all the time since it can get kind of annoying uh, after it's been going for, for a while. With all but one of the structures in place and all the signals in place and wired up under the layout, I could turn most of my attention back to scenery work. I glued some JTT wire trees in a row along the gas station area where I had made a little narrow strip of grass between the road and the gas station. And these trees are really nice in that they are all very durable, made from just twisted wire. I next touched up the paint in various areas and then tackled the base scenery on the mountain. I painted everything with a layer of full strength white glue and then spread on a layer of dirt. This is a dirt ballast mix from Scenic Express and it contains everything from finely sifted dirt to small rocks. And that works really well for a scenery base like this as the heavier and larger particles kind of tend to roll all down to the lower areas, which is what you would actually see in nature as well. I rubbed the dirt into the rocks as well in places to help kind of blend the colors together and then also piled up some Woodland Scenics talus around the waterfall area and sides of the upper river. I covered the talus with more of a dirt to kind of make it look more embedded into the ground and not just sitting on top of it. Once everything looked good, I sprayed down one section at a time with alcohol and then dribbled on diluted matte medium. 
I really soaked the deeper piles of dirt and talus to make sure it was all bonded really well to the layout. I also glued down dirt and rocks to the base of the lake and river itself, and while the glue was still wet, I applied a layer of static grass on the top of the mountain as well at that time. I then repeated the same process to the remaining areas of the layout that didn't have any scenery in place to that point. I had one more structure to build for the layout, and this one was a Pike Stuff Distribution Center kit. I had never actually built a Pike Stuff kit before, and that's kind of amazing considering how uh, many of those are out there uh, available to be used in both N and HO scale. And I really liked the kit. It was easy to build, and since all the windows and doors are applied separately, it is easy to paint everything well and have it look good when you build it. I assembled the walls and roof pieces, painted those, and then painted all the windows and doors while they were still attached to the sprues. Then it was just a matter of cutting those out and gluing them in place. And for the big doors, I wanted to have those open so rail cars could pass through the structure. And so I just cut off a small sliver of each of those doors and glued it to the very top of the opening. I glued the structure to the layout in the right front corner and then piled some dirt and static grass around the edges where it met the layout to hide any of the seams. I wanted the whole area fenced off, and so I used more of the Woodland Scenics chain link fencing that I've used on previous projects. Uh, these aren't quite as realistic as some of the other kits that are available out there, but they are far easier to install, and they're pretty durable, and so you can get a better looking end result with these in many cases, rather than using a more finely detailed, but also much more delicate option that you might end up mangling halfway through the installation. I used a drill bit in my pin vise that was just slightly larger than the post size on the fence sections, and then I drilled holes for each of the posts and glued down one section at a time with super glue. I applied glue to the posts as well as to the bottom edge of each fence section and whatever edge was meeting up with an adjoining fence section. Installation goes fast and easy, and I also made some gates that swing open across the track. I simply took a couple of fence sections with posts and found some aluminum tubing in my scrap box that was just the right size for the posts. I glued the tubes into the layout base, and then I simply have the fence post sitting in the tubing. This way you can gently open and close the gates when you switch cars into the industry. And those might get broken over time, so I'll make sure I have a few extra additional gate sections available and ready to go if needed. I also added fencing around the parking lot of a large warehouse, as well as along the edge of what will be a parking area by the passenger station. Next up was a cell phone tower. I found a BLMA cell phone model kit that I had never built in my scrap box, and so I built that easy to assemble kit and found an open spot behind the structures to place it. I fenced off an area and then made a hole in the base to glue the cell phone tower itself into, and I also added some aluminum tubing and a ladder on the BLMA kit as well so it looks a little bit more realistic. I'll have to find a large electrical box or shed at some point as well to put next to the tower inside the fenced area to kind of complete that overall scene. At this point, I started making some of the super trees I plan to use for most of the forested areas on the layout. I basically just took sections of super tree material, spray painted those a camo brown color, and I'll eventually come back and hit these with a bit of light gray as well before adding the flocking. However, before completing the trees, I needed to add more ground cover. Since this will be a fall themed layout, I needed to have lots of leaves and twigs and such things on the ground around the trees. And so I simply mixed up a bash of the various ground foams I plan to use on the trees, uh, some dead vines that kind of chopped up to look like little branches, and some brown ground foam to look like dead leaves or undergrowth, and whatever little bits of stuff I could find that looked like they might work out. I just mixed up whatever I thought would look reasonable to see on the forest floor into a cup. Then I sprayed various sections of the layout with some alcohol first, since I figured the material would kind of stick a little bit better to a damp surface than a dry one. I sprinkled on the mix, and then I sprayed it down with some diluted matte medium with an old sprayer that didn't really work well. and just kind of dribbled all the glue out in kind of a mess all over, but it worked well enough. Then I sprayed a bit more alcohol on each area to help that glue spread out better and soak into the, uh, the flocking mix. And then I sprinkled down a little bit more of that mix on top to soak up any extra glue. I did the same process for the remainder of the layout and have what you see here. I think it looks pretty reasonable and it will look a lot better once I do have everything covered with a dense covering of fall colored trees. I use super tree material, which is generically called sea foam, uh, for all the tree armatures. And so what I just did was stick a bunch of those on a piece of foam. I sprayed them all with a camo brown spray paint first, then kind of dusted them with a little bit of a light gray primer to kind of add some highlights to the uh, texture of the wood. And then I came back the next day and worked on adding the foliage. 
Now, I made up a mix of diluted matte medium and a cup and kind of just stuck pieces in there, let them soak for a little bit, and then I'd pull them out. And after their brief anti-aging bath, I would basically sprinkle whatever color ground foam I wanted on each of those tree armatures. So I kind of went with oranges and yellows and reds, and uh, as well as some greens and browns. And I try to keep the bright colors pretty sparingly used. Uh, for the most part, your dull reds and burnt orange colors are kind of the more typical fall colors you're going to see on average. You will see, obviously, some brighter reds and oranges and yellows and, and such on trees, but... Typically, you're not going to have all the trees be in a vibrant color all at the same time. And, and so typically, you're going to be kind of seeing these little splashes of brighter color, while other trees are kind of maybe, you know, already turning a little bit brown or, or they're just starting to turn color after being green. And so I'm trying to create as much variation in that range as possible, but keeping those bright colors, for the most part, pretty limited since it doesn't typically look very realistic if all of them are in this very bright, vibrant color. So once I had all the trees on my sheet of foam done, I sprayed them with some more diluted matte medium. And then once that was dry, the next day I came back before planting them and sprayed them down with a flat clear coat to help further secure that ground foam. Now with the first set of trees done, it was time to start installing them. And so this is a pretty simple process. I just simply poked holes in the scenery with a small screwdriver that was about the size of the tree trunks, added some glue and placed each tree in one of the holes. Then I repeated that for all of the remaining trees, but that first set of trees didn't really go very far, and so I made another set and installed those. And I still had a long way to go in order to cover most of the layout, and so I made two more sets of those trees and installed those around the layout. Now, even after that, I still didn't have the coverage I needed. But after a week of making trees and installing trees, I kind of got tired of doing that. And so I moved on to working on some other projects for a while. So the next thing I did was to work on installing some power poles and power lines. And to do that, I picked up the Woodland Scenics utility system to try out on the layout. And this system is pretty cool. It includes a set of poles that have wires already attached and they're sort of a thread-like material that are strung through the poles. And the poles have little holes in the cross arms that those uh, thread wires pass through. So if you look up close, you know, it doesn't look realistic because they're not going on the insulators, they're going through the, you know, the wood cross arms. But with N-Scale especially, if you're standing back a couple of feet, you, you can't tell. I mean, I can't tell with my eyes at least, uh, you know, whether they're going through the cross arm or over it or whatever. They do also have a transformer connect set, which includes transformers you can connect to the main poles. And then some additional poles with single wires to use to run to your structures and to add... And they also give you some conduit that you can place on the structures where the wires would enter the buildings. And so it kind of gives you a complete wiring setup for your layout with these kits. And they do also offer a power substation that you can include on the layout to uh, you know, have some place for all these wires to go to. And these kits are pretty easy to install. I just kind of like trees. I poked holes in the scenery where I wanted each pole to go and then just glued them in place. And so uh, the main thing here is just you can kind of spread the poles out pretty evenly and the wires will basically just slide right along through those poles. And so it's a very easy installation. The only thing you have to do, obviously, is when you get to the end of the set of poles that comes in each package, you're gonna actually glue the thread you know, wires to that last pole so they don't you know, slip out. You wanna get the tension kind of right as well. I thought it would be useful doing this to kind of glue the power lines to each pole as I went along. Uh, so they wouldn't pass through freely and you kind of ripped one out it wouldn't pull the whole thing out it might just uh, or you know break the wire at one pole and and so i thought that might be a better way to go but that caused some tension issues and so the uh as the glue soaked into the thread it kind of changed the the tension on the wires and so some got a little tighter some got a little looser and so it didn't quite look as good as what it did before i applied the glue and so just kind of a lesson learned there now these lines are not as elastic as something like Easy Line, which you can use to do your power lines, uh, which is very stretchy. It's very forgiving if you hit it and that kind of thing. So I don't know how well these will stand up to abuse, you know, if, if they get continuously whacked with hands and, and vacuums or whatever else, but they do seem pretty durable. And so time will tell. 
Next up, it was time to start working on the backdrop. And while I planned to install a photo backdrop, I wanted something in between that and the layout itself. Part of the reason was just simply so if the backdrop wasn't being used, there would still be something there uh, behind that last track and that kind of would help protect trains from falling off the edge and you know back behind the layout. So I cut a thin piece of birch plywood to length and then just cut a wavy top to it. And then after a test fit and some sanding, I painted the layout facing side with brown paint. And while the paint was still wet, I sprinkled on some of the same dirt and ground foam that I use on the layout itself onto the backdrop board. And once I had all the ground foams in place, I soaked them all with the same diluted matte media mix I used elsewhere on the layout. But that moisture was causing the wood to warp, and so I kind of used my ever versatile one, two, three blocks to help weigh everything down and flatten it out while the glue and the paint dried. I secured the backdrop board to the back of the layout mainly with glue, using tape to help hold it against the foam of the layout, and a one by two board clamps to the bottom of the layout, which was pushed tight up against the backdrop board, and that really effectively provided a nice five foot long clamp to help hold that backdrop board up against the layout. I then cut another piece of birch plywood to place on the short side of the layout where the mountain is located to kind of add more strength to that and durability and really just make it look a lot nicer. I also wanted to cover the wiring on the bottom of the layout. While that isn't really needed, I did have to ship this layout and so having the bottom covered would make it far more likely for everything to kind of survive transport. And so I went ahead and I cut a sheet of 1 8 inch birch plywood to fit the bottom of the layout. I cut the corners out as well so the legs would fit through and be easy to attach those and, and take those off. And then I put a big notch on one end where the power strip was and so you could easily uh, you know, reach in there and attach the plugs to it. I did have mounting blocks throughout the underside of the layout and then just the overall wood edge of the layout as well. So I had plenty of places where I could attach that uh, underlayment of birch plywood and screw it in place and secure it. But, you know, with that board lifted up there, I couldn't obviously see where the wiring was. And so I had to make sure I didn't end up putting a screw right through some wires or one of the other components I had underneath the layout. And so what I did was basically to put a thick dab of black paint on the underside of the layout everywhere that I planned to put a screw in to help hold that bottom cover in place. And then I lifted the panel up into place, pushed it up as tight as I could everywhere around the layout. And then when I dropped it back down, I had black dots of paint in all the locations where the screws needed to go. But of course, those were on the inside and not the outside. So I had to go through and drill holes through the middle of all those black dots so when I put the board back up in place, I'd be able to tell exactly where to put the screws and, and make sure they were, they were going to go in safe locations well away from all the wiring. Then it was just really a matter of laying on my back and supporting the wood with my feet and hands and try to kind of get those first few screws in to help hold that board in place. But once I got the first few in, uh, which was a little bit tricky, everything else went pretty smoothly. And now I have a nice bottom cover to the layout, as you can see. One small project I tackled was adding a bit of advertising on the layout as well. I picked up a Miller Engineering sign kit that I installed on the layout at the top of the mountain. All I basically had to do was drill a hole through the layout to pass the wires. And then I attached the sign, which is kind of a very a pretty thin and flexible sign, to a thin piece of birch plywood uh, so it would be pretty durable and it wouldn't get broken if you hit it. And then I had to make up a sign to actually tape onto that uh, blank sign that you got in the kit. And so I just took some old 20 year old transparency film that I had found in the closet and printed out my logo on there and some text. And then I just taped that to the sign using some double sided tape and it looks pretty good. And the control board and batteries that power the sign are located on that side of the layout underneath the mountain as well. And you can just flip a switch there to turn the sign on and off and also control how the lights flash and move around the perimeter of the sign. At this point, I shifted back to working on more trees. I was pretty tired of making trees and so I cheated from this point onward and just picked up some various ready-made scenery materials, including a half dozen boxes of Woodland Scenics fine leaf foliage. Uh, and that's really just super tree material or that sea foam that has already been painted and already flocked for you and it's ready to use. And of course, you pay a pretty hefty price premium for that time savings of not having to paint it and glue everything on there yourself. But at this point in the project, saving time was more important to me than spending quite a bit more time in making all the trees by hand. Uh, the finally foliage kits though are relatively hit and miss in terms of what you get inside each container. 
in this box all the material looked like ready to use trees it was i used all of it as trees actually from that particular box but in the half of the boxes the material wasn't really tree-like it was more just like a big blob of shrubs and, and so you could break off some pieces and use them as trees but for the most part it wasn't as usable and so it was really hit and miss in terms of what you got from each box but i still did use almost all the material from those boxes it's just that some of the material in some boxes was more like clumps of shrubs and some made better trees and so anyway the finally foliage packages allowed me to add dozens of extra trees pretty quickly and in some colors that were just a little bit different from what i already had on the layout kind of adding to that variety of fall color that I had on the layout. And so once I was basically done adding trees, I stained the sides and back of the layout a cherry color to match the layout frame. And so from that point on, it was time to get that photo backdrop prepared and installed. I un unrolled the backdrop on some birch plywood to kind of try and figure out how I wanted everything to uh, be arranged. And since that lower third of the backdrop wasn't going to be visible anyways, it'll be behind the layout, I didn't have to cover that whole bottom third of the backdrop board. I then glued and clamped together a couple layers of 1 8 inch birch plywood to, you know, basically get it to the thickness I wanted. And also kind of create a little bit of a ledge for that backdrop to basically use to sit on the back edge of the layout. I then put a strip of wood along the bottom edge as well, and so when the backdrop was in place along the back edge of the layout, that wood at the bottom would help prevent the backdrop from lifting up, and the ledge on top would help prevent it from falling down. And so all I had to do was kind of hold it up against the back of the layout to keep it from moving in any direction. I then stained and polyurethane the backdrop, the wood additions on the sides of the layout, as well as some trim pieces I wanted to put around the printed backdrop. I was kind of worried that the backdrop would eventually curl around the edges and peel off uh, from the backdrop with time, and so those trim pieces pretty much prevent that from ever happening. I laid out the printed backdrop where I wanted it, made sure the wood was clean and smooth, and then I started applying it. All I had to do was basically pull off the back covering on the adhesive back on one side, get it you know lined up how I wanted it so it was parallel to the sides, and then just worked my way down the backdrop, smoothing everything out and trying to get all the air bubbles out. Then I glued on the trim pieces using some waste to hold them in place while everything dried and things were ready to go. To install the backdrop on the back of the layout, I just rested on the layout frame and then secure it with a couple of bent nails. And later I changed those to be slightly nicer looking L-shaped hooks, but basically functioned the same way. I also made and installed a little door to cover the access hole in the side of the mountain in order to better finish off that side of the layout as well. The last major step was to work on the water features. There was a small pond on one end of the layout and I did that water feature first. I mixed up two part Envirotex epoxy and added just a hint of blue color to the mix and then poured that on the layout and used a small blowtorch to remove the air bubbles before it cured. The main water feature was up next, and I started out with the waterfalls since those were the main focus of the whole water feature. I mixed up more of the two-part epoxy and used the cotton ball technique once again that I've used on some previous projects. I soaked uh, stretched out cotton balls in the Envirotex and then applied them where the waterfalls were located. The cotton is really absorbs a lot of the epoxy and keeps it from running down. And you can basically apply it and sculpt it and get it into the shape that you want, although it is very sticky, but it does allow you to kind of work the waterfall in place vertically instead of doing it kind of like horizontally, you know, off the layout and then gluing it on later. I did the small waterfall first and then the rapids above the big waterfall and then finally the big waterfall itself. And this was a little tricky since again, the epoxy so cotton wants to stick to everything you try to touch it to. And so I had to kind of place it on the layout and then, you know, usually just using two different sticks or a couple pairs of tweezers, one to kind of hold it down, another one so you could pull the other tweezer away and then eventually kind of get things worked in place. And uh, basically you just have to be careful not to make a big mess of things. But I gradually built up one layer of the waterfall and then I poured the resin I had left over at the top of the upper stream and just let it run down towards and over the waterfall, filling in all the low areas along the way. I then mixed up another batch of the Envirotex epoxy so I could add onto the waterfall and then pour what I had left over into the lake area to produce the first layer of water there. I then let that dry overnight and then came back the next day and added a second layer of epoxy soaked cotton to the waterfall to help fill it out. 
I also poured in the second layer of epoxy in the main lake area since that was going to need a few layers to get to the depth I needed. Since this layer ended up being pretty thin, I decided to mix up another batch of epoxy to add to the lake depth. Since things were going well, I decided to try and wreck everything by adding way too much of the blue dye to the epoxy mix. And for some reason, I thought it would become more transparent when mixing with the existing epoxy in a thin layer and look more like blue sky reflecting off the water, but it really didn't. It actually doesn't look that bad on the video, but in person, I couldn't really stand the way it looked, and so I had to try and fix it. So a couple of days later, I took two shades of darker Vallejo acrylic model paint and mixed that in with another batch of the Envirotex. And the Vallejo paint works really well as a way to dye the Envirotex epoxy. I poured a thin layer of that new darker shade on top of the existing cured epoxy resin, and I think it came out pretty good. I was going for a blend of some New England River photos that I found online like these two here, and I tried to get something in the general ballpark of those photos, and I think it came out pretty close. Finally, I touched up the waterfalls a bit with some Woodland Scenics water effects in the lake and river with some water ripples, also from Woodland Scenics, and dry brushed on some white paint to kind of highlight the overall waterfall itself. Now, I thought it'd be kind of fun to add some canoes to the river, and so I added a pair of Woodland Scenics canoes uh, and canoers, and I added them right underneath the bridges so you would only see them from certain angles, and I thought it'd be kind of a nice little surprise that you would find as you looked around the layout. The layout was still lacking people though, and so I worked on adding some benches and people around the train station and then around the town in general, along with a few dogs and cats. Next, I added some road striping to the bridge using a Woodland Scenics road striping pen. I didn't add striping anywhere else just because I thought I couldn't effectively you know, add those markings in place without make, making a mess of the road or causing damage to something else alongside the road or whatever. And so while there are certainly road markings and other items that are definitely missing from the layout, especially around the grade crossing, I generally just felt it was better to leave those off than to put them in there, but do a bad job of it where it'd be very obvious that it was, you know, messed up. And so I just felt it was just kind of a safer thing to leave some of those things out, especially in N-Scale, because it's uh, a lot more obvious when you make a mistake than it is when you just sort of leave something out. I continued to add more people and random details around the layout, including a couple more road signs. Uh, and I glued down all the vehicles as well so they wouldn't roll around during transport and they would pretty much just stay where they needed to be. The hotel needed some potted trees, so I added those, as well as a few more trees around the layout since I did have a little bit of that fine leaf foliage stuff left over uh, from those packages I had purchased. Finally, I wanted to make a small construction scene somewhere on the layout. I had this nice N-scale excavator and decided to take some uh, plastic tubing, paint it a gray concrete color, and get a couple of figures I had in one of my kits that had uh, shovels with them, and make a small little scene where they're working on a drain line of some type. And so I piled up some of the same dirt I used elsewhere in the layout around the scene and then soaked everything thoroughly with diluted matte medium. And I think it came out pretty nice. And I really like how it adds. It's one of those little extra scenes. It's kind of fun to look at as you walk around the layout. And after that, I decided the layout was pretty much good enough to call complete. Plus, I really wanted to get the layout delivered to the client and that side of the garage available for our second car before any significant winter weather set in. And to aid in delivery, I built a box around the layout to help protect the layout during shipment, and it can be easily removed by a single person during setup like I show here. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the journey with me this year as I built this three and a half by five and a half foot end scale layout. This is a great little layout for watching a couple of trains run, and it has a 12 uh, and three quarter inch minimum radius, which is good enough for most rolling stock to navigate. While there isn't a lot of switching operations, there are a couple of industries to switch along with an interchange track or staging track that can be used uh, for future expansion sometime down the road. The layouts I'll be building in 2022 will all be smaller, which will hopefully allow me to complete a few of them during the course of the year. So be sure to subscribe if you haven't already so you don't miss those new layout projects. Also, if you want to help support the channel above and beyond just watching the videos, maybe consider buying me a cup of coffee. I'll have a link where you can do that down in the description below. But anyway, that's all for this video. Enjoy some of the final looks at this three and a half by five and a half foot layout. And thanks for watching. Bye.